Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of JD and Masters and today we are in Nissan Heritage Collection and this is a very special place for car lovers and especially Nissan fans and I'm joined today by Josh. It's your first time here, isn't going? it? Yeah, it's my first time here. I actually can't believe I'm here. I mean, this is the must-do place to go if you're a Nissan fan because I'm telling you there's so much you can look in here. I've brought a little book today uh, and those of you who play Gran Turismo will know of the extensive amount of cars inside and we're gonna be trying to looking for all of these cars oh, that yeah. appear in Gran Turismo 4 this is an old guidebook that I have and since this is a whole car collection of over 300 cars kept in pristine working condition I mean look at this the old Skyline Sylvia's GTR's we're going to be searching for all these inside. So I am now inside the Zama Nissan Heritage Collection Hall. And I've got this guidebook with me which has all of the cars inside here. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about why this place exists. So the Zama Operation Factory uh, actually makes Nissan cars, uh, they still do. Uh, they've made, they're making electric cars now, but then they've kept a side of the warehouse facilities to house and store all of Nissan's historic cars. I mean, we're talking about cars right from the very start of Nissan's history uh, with Tobata Casting and Datsun and even the, uh, the early Tama cars and Prince cars. I mean, look here, we have the first car that they manufactured in the 1930s and over on this corner on the left, it's all of the classic cars right up to the 50s. We're going to be bringing you each of these sections in, in separate videos to go more detail into it. We'll be also covering the race cars and the rally cars and all the modern fan favorite Skylines, Sylvia's, um, Fair Lady Zets. On the second row, we have cars from the 70s to the 80s. I grew up in the 80s as a kid and my, my dad, my mom, my relatives and everyone around me had these cars and it's just such a nostalgic moment. It's such a mind-blowing moment to see how well kept these cars are. It's like watching Back to the Future and seeing these boxy 80s styling. One point about these cars, they all are in running condition and sometimes they do bring them over to shows uh, for different exhibitions. What surprises me the most is just, look at this, the upholstery, the interior um, has just been kept mint condition. There's no discoloring at all. Uh, even the rubber seals, they're all intact. You can see a little bit of restoration work going on. Like for example, in the corners, there's still a bit of uh, uh, the paint off, but otherwise pretty much just mint. And the hall itself is just super clean. It's just a bit like the, uh, the Spoon Type 1 workshop that we visited earlier on. I think the feeling is like being in someone's private, like a rich guy's private car collection rather than you know a nice carpeted showroom with with uh, with down light it really feels like it's a car collection garage made for enthusiasts by enthusiasts we've got primary school kids coming here on an excursion to learn more about their country's premier automakers culture and history that's a really nice thing you know kids are learning about um, the history of cars and maybe they influence them to uh, become car engineers in the future or mechanics you know i just want to talk a little bit about these three cars here they look very quirky and really weird but really they are based on the first generation nissan k11 march and these are called pike cars and at that time in the early 90s it was a time of extravagance and experimentation with the bubble economy and these cars were made after a competition for styling uh, to restart them for fashion and promotion purposes and the very first one that came out is right here the BE1. Now still based on the March platform, uh, this first design really only changed like the hood, the bumper and the, and the fenders. Second one here called the POW. I mean, just look at this thing. Would, would you believe that this was actually a Nissan? Uh, I like how the door handle hinges are on the outside and just looks so industrial. It's like a, a 1960s or 1950s American refrigerator. They proceeded to make the third model called the Ferrago. It was really different. It's not a hatchback anymore. It's like a, a, a more like a coupe. And believe it or not, these three Pike cars are collector's items now among hardcore Nissan fans, like non-sports car fans. And there is actually a shop which we'll be visiting sometime in the future, which specializes in collecting and restoring these Pike cars. Really? Yeah. 
on the left side, you see all these old Fairlady Zs. And we're gonna talk about that in detail in our next video with the iconic 70s Fender side mirrors, which was very popular in Japan. This looks like something out of a, a police movie from the 70s and the 80s. So we have the Nissan Sunny, which is the rival car to the Toyota Corolla. The Gloria was a very important model because it was the basis for uh, the President which was a car used by the Imperial family. So we're going to be coming back onto that later on. And on the far side here, we have a couple of important cars from Nissan sports history. This is the Fair Lady, the Fair Lady and not the Fair Lady Z. So we have a huge selection here, many, many different variations of different engines. We're going to come back to that later. The 1970s Skyline and Bluebird range. And going even further back in time, we have some of the best selections of Prince Motor Company's cars before they actually merged with Nissan and created that Skyline GTR legend. Now Prince was a company that was involved in precision engineering and aircraft. They carried the name Skyline and Gloria and this was the basis of some technology that Nissan adopted and put into the race car which we'll have a look at later on. Nice sheet metal and chrome everywhere. A lot of the styling, as you can see, has styling cues from well-known Italian car designers. And in fact, a lot of them were actually commissioned to design houses like uh, Paninfarina, uh, Gugario, Bertone. It's these beautiful curves over the fenders and that prominent grille looking a lot like uh, some early Alfa Romeos in the 60s. Just to see them here in absolutely restored showroom shining condition is just mind-blowing. This American looking wagon uh, is called the Skyway, which is actually the wagon, early wagon version of the Skyline called the Prince Skyway. Look at these cues. Oh, the rear, the rear fender, the way it, um, it's gonna stick sound like a Batmobile. It really is a, a lot of American influence back then. Nissan Exa Canopy was a, is a very good example of over-engineering in bubble economy. I mean, look at this strange rear. That shell piece actually is an interchangeable Lego type kind of uh, design. This wagon could be turned into a pickup, it could also be turned into a coupe just by interchanging canopy. It's detachable and can turn into a Targa top. The first Exa uh, Pulsar NX, uh, known overseas, was simply a Targa convertible. And then, so they made the second generation with an even more crazy design. Unsurprisingly, it was too much for some people and they didn't really sell many, but real collectors of strange cars like the Pikes, the Pikes cars have become real collectors and command quite a high price in the collector circle right now. Down here on the fourth row, we have every single significant Skyline and including Nissan Skyline GTS right on the right here. This is how they came out from the factory. What are you doing, Japonic? The cleanest interior of our I've ever seen. <laughs> that stock, nothing touched. Even the tape is like brand new. All of them lined up, looking gleaming and polishing, just like the day they left the production line in the factory. In fact, maybe a lot of these uh, have been restored further. For example, this car here, I believe, is the Nürburgring Time Attack car, which set the record in 1995 was the first Japanese production car to achieve eight minutes, which was a feat for any production car um, in its day. You can see the roll cage inside was the prototype test car. Personally think that, especially with Japanese cars, the golden age, uh, the peak of design and technological uh, advancement was really in the 90s. And obviously the best example of such kind of car is these two R34 GTRs right here. Now this one is the V-Spec 2 and you can see it from the, uh, the carbon fiber NACA duct on the bonnet offset to one side and the Millennium Jade M-Spec Nürburgring, the final edition with all of the best parts in the, in the Nissan Skyline GTR range, uh, N1 engine block and some other special parts all rolled into one car. It's the most luxury model because it has leather seats the M apparently stands for Mizuno, who was the father of the engineering of the, of the Skyline GTR and also the R35 GTR. So, I mean, we have here the general Paul Walker spec Skylines, but then this is what cemented the legacy of the Nissan GTRs. And we actually had these using the Group A, uh, Group A Motorsports of Australia. 
Mark Scaife and Jim Richards, under Fred Gibson who was the engineer, made these cars that dominating that they uh, beat the Ford Sierra Cosworths, which were the contenders back in the day. We coined the name Godzilla Monster from Japan in our press because it was just that crazy and it was that good that we actually had to change the Group A laws, camps actually cancelled the Group A and actually created V8 supercars because these were that good. And they even tried to limit them because in the peak 1991 season, they won 9 out of 11 championships. And over on the far end, we have a collection of Nissan Cedrics and the President. These models were competing with the Toyota Crown and the Century, the leader in the luxury Japanese luxury car market. Not forgetting the Bluebird Triple S 2-liter Atessa which basically had the same running gear and engine as the Pulsar GTI R WC homologation car, but in a big sedan body. Perhaps those rivals were the Subaru Legacy and the Mitsubishi Galant VR4. This is relatively an unknown performance car, even by hardcore Nissan fans. Hiding right here in the corner, a strange looking yellow coupe. It's known as the Nissan NX Coupe. It's quirky, but memorable, front mass design. Many cars from the eight, from the 70s, 80s and the 90s um, did look like mini versions of contemporary American or European cars and this is, well, you know, one, one of those and uh, such was the fashion and trend of Japanese consumers uh, during the bubble era. Perhaps even more interesting was that the bubble economy prompted car makers to spend money on different kinds of technology and design. And can you imagine one point of time each car maker had at least 20 to 25 different models in their lineup? Oh, oh my Those God. are pretty famous in Australia, right? Yeah, they were great imports, but we just we snatched up so many that came from Japan. Actually was not necessarily used in like your standard S chassis models. I mean the biggest differences were that was that they actually had solid lifters. They used a different turbocharger, they had individual throttle bodies, a stronger oil pump, and they actually still used a distributor system, which was usually used on the NASR20s. I mean, even S13s use call over plug ignition, but they actually used it in Group A Rally Car, and they weren't necessarily that bad, but the issue was the, the top mount intercooler was still retained, which caused heating issues, and Nissan was actually pushing really hard for them to win straight off the bat, which is, I mean, it's generally impossible for a for a first sort of level rally car, first edition rally car. And actually Tommy Mackinnon was one of the drivers of these cars. And in the final section of the Nissan Heritage Hall are the motorsports historic cars. On the left hand side are all of Nissan's historic and most prominent rally cars, all lined up straight from the 1958 uh, first Moby Gas Australia rally car. This is a car that Japanese manufacturers Toyota and Nissan entered into the Moby Gas Trial Rally, which is actually a, a rally it's circumnavigates Australia. the whole the of Australia. 50s. I mean, I even know modern cars which break down, just, just going down the road in the outback. I mean, when we say down the road, like a couple of thousand k's, like this? I mean, come on. And you got to think, it wasn't just one driver in a bit. They had to keep supplies, spare parts, two drivers for 10,000 kilometers back in those days. I mean, that just shows the engineering prowess that Nissan had back in the day. That accident, right? They didn't repair it. It's still here. Yeah, it's still driving with that. Most of the race car and rally cars here are kept in the condition that they finish the race. Mm. And on the right, racing cars, uh, everything from the Prince R380 to the early Prince Skylines, prototype racers all the way down to the famous Hakuska Grand Prix winner. And on the other side to Super GT cars, uh, BTCC, uh, Le Mans, Super TIQ, N1 series, all lined up there. Some of these cars are fantastically uh, restored and others are kept as they finish the race with all the dirt and damage on it. And that's just one of the most fascinating uh, aspects of this museum because they show it as it is. It gives you the feeling of how it was, the, the, the grime, the sweat and the smell of the racing. Overall winner of the 21st East African Safari Rally. That must have been a really tough rally isn't it because the car's missing part of the front bumper and the whole right Watch, fender got a bit beat up and it looks like at some point they had no choice but to just wire hold the the headlight and the indicator that's what rallying is about mate 
you know. Exactly. As long as it works, that's all you want. It's, it's um, function over form, I guess you could say. And I must say, the priority in a rally is actually to reach the finish line in a <laughs> still running condition. And then, yeah. Because you don't know whether you're actually going to win the rally because it's all no. time trial taken, right? No, no. And then it would be a, a nice surprise if you win uh, the rally after. It's racing cars are different. You know at that very moment if you win or not. Oh, look at this. This competed in the Southern Cross International Rally in Australia, which was oh, yeah. also, interestingly, uh, where Mitsubishi and the, and the original Lancer um, made its breaking ground. So the Chrysler Lancer? The, the Celeste Lancer, yeah, yeah the very yeah. first one. And so oh, we I have here. Turbo. That's right, that's right. Oh, right, right. But look at that. Southern Cross Rally stickers, Rally Mo Nissan Moto Australia. Oh, look, history from your country, mate. Have a look at that, guys. What's so special about this car here? This is actually a Nissan Silvia S12, but it's a 240 RS rally car, and it uses the F24 engine, which was only used in this vehicle. This, I mean, it's crazy. 2.4 liter NA engine in the early 80s pushing out 240 horsepower. I mean, it was a rear wheel drive. It wasn't the most successful rally car of the period, but I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, look at these fenders. Just look at the styling. It just screams 80 so much, but at the same time, it's so unique. And it was such a trendsetter back in the day. I think a lot of people, uh, modern Nissan Silvia fans, do not know anything before the S13. Uh, yes and no. I mean, it does depend on people. I mean, generally, it's all like, oh, it's all S chassis or Skylines, you know? But, I mean, if it wasn't for cars like this, we wouldn't have the Nissans that people venerate so much today. What makes JDM so cool as well is the fact that you actually have these unique badges on the front of cars. That's right, that's Gen right. Generally internationally, you've only got the main manufacturer logo on the cars. I mean, some people would scream for this. It's the same as the Silvias back home. We used to get the 200SX. And to have just that lightning Silvia badge of the S15 or the other Silvia badge of the S14 on your car, I mean, that just made it what it is JDM. You know why they put um, tape over the headlights? Because when you... Because when the car gets into a crash, the glass material will scatter everywhere on the circuit yeah, for safety. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's not just it's not just a styling cue. It's actually a bit functional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy wedge-looking Lemons prototypes cars were actually not really aerodynamically efficient. Airflow that was good for dragging the entire front of uh, underneath of the car was completely flat, so air would just go slip past like that. But it didn't actually have enough downforce on these. Group C cars had 700 horsepower, weighed slightly over a ton. And what happened was a lot of these cars would just actually attempt to take off straight into the air and flip. The last of its kind, 1991 R91 CP, uh, driven by Hoshino-san himself, works Nissan driver. This was the final development with the 3.5 liter V8 twin turbo engine delivering 800 horsepower from a weight of only 850 kilograms. I mean, this was the king back in Gran Turismo if you wanted to win like the high speed trials. And it's just remarkable and fantastic to see right here in the flesh, whole lineup of, of prototypes, which they kept on improving year after year. Similar to what Toyota was doing as well. I think Toyota and Nissan were the only two manufacturers that were really pushing hard to try and uh, win in Le Mans but this is what every Gran Turismo fan needs to see Japan Touring Car Championship or Super GT as it is known today these GT 300 and 500 racing cars were also in Gran Turismo and if you see here the Pennzoil Nismo GTR which I played a lot in Gran Turismo for it's right here look at that all yellow, wide fiberglass body, like the silhouette cars of the 80s. This is a similar formula. And the only thing that resembles a road car are the shape of the headlights, the roof line and the windscreen and the rear lights. Everything else was a pure race car. So that's what JGTC and Super GT cars are. But they also had to use the original uh, engine block and cylinder head from uh, a production Nissan model. So what's interesting is that the early R34s were still using an RB26 engine and later ones, um, it's not here today, I think it's been brought for restoration or whatever, 
switch to the VQ 3.5 liter engine when the Z33 a fair lady Z came out. Just like how Toyota switched from the uh, 2JZ to the, the 3SG. Yeah, that's right. The Supras yeah. of the day actually the is 3SG yes. TEs. So, you know, Toyota and Nissan were competing really, really hard in the JGTC. Yeah. This is what every JDM fan of the 90s heralded as tuning inspiration. I mean, come on guys, can you actually believe Keiichi Tsuchiya drove this? Yes, the famous Tyson STP Group A VNR32 car. Dr. Godzilla himself, who is Fred Gibson, who pioneered the Australian side of Group A, actually was, gonna in, actually was invited to the Fuji 1000, and Mr. Kakimoto-san himself caught him and actually told him not to come because the Australian spec GDR would actually be better than the Nismo spec, which they actually supplied a lot of the engines for the Group A. Oh, wow. Yeah. So these super silhouette cars uh, were the precursor to the Super GT uh, cars that we yes. saw. Yes, yes. It was FIA Group 5 regulations. Yep. And I mean, essentially what's only the same as the original car is, is actually just the roof line and the bonnet and the engine. They had to use the same engine block. When you look inside, it's just a shell with the Recaro. Look at all those switches. It is just bare bones simple. I mean, look, it looks like they've almost even hole sawed the door panels just to fit the weight. And this roll cage actually was removable. That's the way you got in. See that clip? They actually unbolt it, slide it out so you could fit in. And the, uh, the, the, the side fender flares, my God, or just the fenders in general. Look how wide out they are because the suspension system wasn't even used in the road car. It's just, it's just crazy. I mean, even these SSR rims, these actually have these weird fans on the front and they were actually used to dissipate brake heat at high speeds. So I'm telling you, this exhaust system is what made this car famous. And that was due to the fact that it just spat out hectic flames and kept those flames down on the downships. It's just crazy. I mean, just look at this video. This is another super silhouette, the uh, Nissan Bluebird. These three cars actually use the same L series engine, the LZ20B, 570 PS. And I mean, this car itself was a thousand kilos. That was actually faster than the Formula One cars of the 1980s. And I mean, what can you tell me about this styling, Ken? It's actually based off the boss is like. Yeah, I the boss is actually based their styling off these cars. That's right. The 80s was all about boxy squaring, but this it takes was. it up to another level, isn't it? Just it just took it up to another level. I mean, would you honestly think that you'll make this into a road going version? Or, sorry, how should I put it? You will get elements of this and put it into a road going version car. That's exactly what these guys did. Yeah, I mean, even this Nissan March, it wasn't as powerful. I mean, but look at this. It's a tiny March. It was 168 horsepower. And actually, Masahiko himself was a singer and a racer who drove this car. And you see that number 19 right over there? See it styling? See the side of it? This car actually inspired the boss Zoku to put that same styling on their own cars. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is an R35 GT3 race car. So the GT3 is a modern... It's actually the Nissan Academy. Yes, 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 that's right. Yeah, so Gran Turismo 6 and 5. Was Gran it? Turismo supports, uh, was supported and sponsored by Nissan to run their uh, Academy yeah. to get winners. And here we have the last selection of Nissan presidents and more uh, from the 1990s. Um, the one on the left is the most luxurious spec of the president uh, that was competing with the Crown Royal and even the Century. But this one on the right here, as you can see, it's a convertible. This was a parade car that they used for the Prime Minister or the Japanese Emperor during parades. So guys, that was a very quick overview of a one and a half hour tour of the Nissan Heritage Museum. Um, there's lots of different car models in there and there's just so much I want to talk about, but we're going to come back next time and review uh, each series of models more significantly. But I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to catch a subscribe here and catch you in the next video. Peace out. 300 cars, right? 300 cars, and this place has got 5,600 square meters. Concept car that came before the NSX. Right, here we are, guys. That smell, that is just the best smell right there. <sighs>
it's that, that slightly carbon monoxide poison oh will just get you all. Look at this, guys. Every major model, sports model, Skyline, Sylvia, Fair Lady, and there Pulsar. Are race cars over there too, right? Yes. Race cars are all over that side, and we're going to be looking. Far out. I mean, look, I wish, look at this. Look at this. I wish I could just sleep here. We forgot 180's normal body type, you know? So you have all the Fair Lady, the S130 and S130. So the boys are really flabbergasted right now at the selection and condition. Flabbergasted is an understatement. <laughs> I mean, to see this many clean old Nissans in one they, they spot. They even had station wagons signed. Yes, I yes. Didn't, I didn't know. And they even had a station wagon Skyline back then. Did they? Yeah. Skyline, not a station, station wagon Skyline. Yeah, the R30 had a station wagon, and the earlier um, oh, Prince yes, Nissan, yes. it was something called the Nissan oh, Skyway. That oh, is a gearbox. sofa from the 1980s. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is my favorite Fair Lady Z, by the way. This looks like Back to the Future. Yes, exactly, exactly. It looks like Back to the Future. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Nowadays, it's so hard to see so clean GTRs, you know? This is how they came out from the factory. What are you doing, Japonic? <laughs> the cleanest interior of art I've ever seen. <laughs> that stock, nothing touched. Even the tape is like brand new. These are just the road cars, guys. <laughs> look at this. Oh look my this. It God. just came out of the race. Yeah. Like, look at this. And the dirt will still come out yeah. of it. <laughs> I'm just that mind blown right now at the moment. I mean, it's just starting. I remember this. I remember watching this on TV. On TV. It has like 35 VIN at the back. Look at the VIN. How much downforce do you need in the desert? A lot. <laughs> when you go on high speeds on a soft surface, you need, you need that thing to be pushing you down. You see that gold R35 over there? Whose car is that? Oh, that's, that's it's the same balls. It's same balls, right? Yeah, there's only two in the world. They do run this car sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. They will start it later. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah okay. that's why the exhaust uh, tunnels yeah. there.